Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rustin Leno, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nadia Polikarpova who uh, has a, a long history of um, doing interesting things in uh, verification. She was a um, PhD student in um, uh, Bertrand Meyer's group in, at ETH and wrote a thesis on um, a semantic collaboration, which extended uh, the, the sort of um, things that we had tried to do in the, uh, the SpecSharp project and the VCC project uh, here in, um, uh, at, uh, in the RISE group and uh, extended it in ways that, um, that we could not have imagined at, at the time um, to, to let you write specifications of, of programs. And then she has uh, looked at specifications in different languages, written um, a fully verified um, uh, collections library. Uh, she, is, she, was an, she did an internship here with Michal Moscow, uh, working on security properties of the, the TPM, which she did in the context of the VCC verifier. Um, the list goes on. She's uh, participated in several um, uh, verification competitions, and there was one that I thought that um, she was the clear winner, and somehow the, the um, no winner was ever announced. I don't know what happened to the contest. It was very strange, but um, in my eyes, she was the, the winner. Um, yes, and she's, uh, um, she's worked on... Um, uh, on a tool called Boogaloo, which executes uh, boogie programs. And if you know what boogie programs are and the partial commands, you'll be wondering how this is done, and you're welcome to ask her afterwards. And um, uh, <clears throat> many of you who, um, who are, for example, on the Ironclad project or have used Daphne will be familiar with and will love the calc statement that is in, um, uh, in there to, to write proofs, and uh, that's also Nadia's work here. So today, though, she's not going to talk of, uh, about any of that. She's going to talk about synthesis. And let me just end by announcing that, the, that if you're watching this talk online, uh, I'll be monitoring questions. So if you have questions, you can um, type those in as well. So with no further ado, welcome, Nadia. Thank you very much, Rustam. Um, so I'm currently doing a postdoc at MIT with Armando Solorizama. So I'm working on synthesis because verification was too easy for me. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk today about something that we've been doing with Armando in the past like uh, half a year. And it's program synthesis from refinement types. It's very much work in progress still. Um, so there are some things that maybe are not perfectly working yet. But uh, I will be really curious to, to uh, hear what you have to say about this and, and uh, be happy about any feedback. Um, OK. As we all know, developing programs is hard. And developing correct programs that always do what they're intended to do is even harder. Um, and the goal of program synthesis is to help us with that by providing us with a way to describe programs that is more high level, more concise, or more intuitive than what um, programming languages, mainstream programming languages can offer us today. And uh, in the end, the program synthesizer will transform this description into something that is still efficiently executable. But since the difference between um, those two descriptions is uh, quite large, there is no algorithm that can just simply uh, do the compilation. And usually, some kind of search is involved in synthesis. So in a high level, most program synthesizers look like this. There will be some component that can explore the space of candidate programs. And there will be um, another component that can check that a candidate uh, actually matches the description that the user provided, and then give some kind of feedback to the explorer. And this goes on and on until we find something that actually matches. All right. And um, if we want, one important point is that if we want the synthesis process to be completely automatic, then of course the verification has to be completely automatic as well. Um, and the whole field of program synthesis is quite large. And I'm, I'm going to focus on like one specific area, which is automatic synthesis of recursive functional programs, which is um, an area that um, is, is, is very popular in recent years. And in that area, um, people are using uh, mostly 
those uh, three different kinds of um, inputs of, of specifications and uh, corresponding verification procedures. Because of course, the verification procedure and the input language has to have to match um, on some level. So uh, one kind of uh, specification language that people use are simply input-output examples. And um, of course, how can we verify a program uh, for a set of input output examples, we can just execute them. So we use like a good old testing. And some tools that were successful um, uh, with, with this kind of specification are uh, Escher, which was uh, by Sumit and uh, Aus. And then um, Myth is from um, Steve Stanchevich and his group. And Lambda Squared is uh, from Rice and UT Austin. Um, then another kind of synthesis tools in, for functional programs uses bounded checking as the way to um, verify candidate programs. And what I mean by bounded checking is um, you have some kind of uh, executable assertion, or probably you have um, a program that is unoptimized used as a specification for, to, for generating uh, an optimized program. And um, so the techniques. Uh, that I used here are usually like SAT-based um, bounded checking techniques. And um, so Sketch is sort of a popular tool that works on a similar principle, but there is a variant of Sketch that's called Syntrack that actually does uh, synthesis of, automatic synthesis of functional programs. And uh, finally, this goes all the way to the other end of the spectrum, where as a specification, we use fully formal specifications, perhaps written in some kind of rich logics with quantifiers or uh, recursive predicates. And as a way to verify programs against those specifications, we can use deductive verification. And Leon from Victor Kunchak's group is one example of such a tool. Um, so all those techniques have, of course, their um, advantages and disadvantages and trade-offs. So here they're pretty much located uh, from like the least formal that required the least level of expertise from the user to sort of the most formal. But of course, they all have their um, disadvantages as well. So uh, if you look at those both techniques on the left, they only provide um, guarantees of correctness for a finite number of inputs. And as a result, they might not work as well for more complex programs. So for input and output examples, uh, the result is that for a more complex program, the user might have to provide a lot of inputs and outputs and think about a lot of corner cases. Uh, for example, I know that for myth, um, even a program as simple as dropping a certain number of elements from the list requires 13 input-output pairs. Um, and for, for this, those kind of tools um, that do sort of exhaustive bounded checking, well, there if um, a certain bound is not enough um, to guarantee that the, the program is really correct, the checking has to go up to a higher bound, and then it gets slow. So it doesn't scale to, um, uh, to checking the programs on many, many inputs. On the other hand, this, the deductive verification doesn't have this problem of scaling too many inputs, but uh, it does have the problem that it is rarely fully automatic. Because for deductive verification, you know that sometimes you need to in give some hints as to how to instantiate quantifiers, or even worse, you have to provide invariants. Um, so wouldn't it be just great if we had something that gives us unbounded verification, but fully automatically? Of course, <laughs> that would be great. Um, and if it works for a, uh, a big enough class of programs, that that would be what we want. So in this work, we decided to try a different kind of input language for synthesis and a different kind of uh, verification procedure, which is based on types and type checking. Um, so it's not a new thing in the functional programming community to use types to specify computations. For example, if you're a Haskell programmer, you're probably familiar with this tool called Hoogle. And what Hoogle does, uh, I can show you right now, it's a website where you can search for um, functions from standard Haskell library using their type. For example, if I'm thinking, well, what was this function called that takes an integer and the value of any type A 
and produces a list of A's of the length of the first argument. And I don't, I don't remember its name. And then Hugo will tell me, oh, the first result that Hugo returns is replicate. And this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted some number of copies of, of the value. But of course, the Haskell type system is good enough to do a search um, in the standard library, but it's not rich enough to describe a goal for, for synthesis. So we need a more expressive type system for that. And we decided to use refinement types. So the uh, refinement types, this term is used a lot in different contexts. So I'm going to quickly explain what we mean in this work by refinement types. If you're familiar with work of, of Frenchie Jala and his group, on liquid types, then this is exactly what we mean. And if you're not familiar, I will just go um, through the basics of this kind of refinement types. So we call them general decidable refinement types. And basically what it is, is um, a conventional type, think ML or a Haskell type, that is decorated with a predicate that restricts um, the range of values that this, uh, this type has. So for example, this one here describes a type of natural numbers. Um, and the difference between refinement types and why we call them decidable refinement types, uh, the difference between those and general um, dependent types is that those predicates are drawn from some kind of decidable logic, efficiently decidable by SMT solvers. And this is an important fact because this makes our verification decidable. Um, so this judgment over here would say that uh, variable n has this type of natural numbers. And um, this particular type we we're going to abbreviate as nat later. OK. So what we can express with those, uh, yes? So can you explain more about, about like an uh, efficiently desirable type by the SMT solvers? Is, is, is that kind of a computation class? Or? Um, so it's basically. Um, the whole approach is parameterized with what kind of logic you want to use in the refinements, not sort of specified. But the logic that people usually use is, uh, would be linear integer arithmetic with uninterpreted functions and arrays. So this is kind of a, a class that is yeah, well explored and, and can express a lot of stuff. But you can plug in other logics there as, as long as you can decide them efficiently. Thank you. Um, OK, what can we express with those? Um, so not only we can talk about base types, restrict base types like integers, but we can also um, give refinement types to functions. For example, this type over here describes function max, maximum of two integers, as a function that takes uh, an two unrestricted integers, x and y, and returns a value that is greater or equal than both of, the, of its arguments. And as you can see, in function types, we can give names to the arguments so that we can use them later in the type of the result. And this is what makes it depend on function types. And this is what lets us express pre and post conditions. Um, and finally, we also have algebraic data types, which are polymorphic. For example, this one here says that x is, is a list, and each element of this list is a natural number. So this nat, again, is just an abbreviation for this. So the um, definition of list is just what you would expect in a, uh, with a regular type system. But as you can see, we could instantiate this um, type parameter here with a refined type to express um, a non-trivial property that every uh, element of the list is greater or equal to 0. And not only we can express such universal properties of data structures, we can also talk, uh, for example, about the length of the list using the construct called measure. So you can think of a, this measure length as just a function defined inductively on the lists. But it's really uh, syntactically restricted in such a way that you just have a one definition of length for every list constructor. And in terms of verification, what happens with this definition is basically there is a syntactic transformation that takes those uh, definitions of length and just appends them as refinements to each to the types to the type of each constructor of the list. And at this point, you can just treat this length as an completely as an uninterpreted function. Uh, so you can forget about this definition and 
everything we know about length is just that the length of nil is zero and the length of cons can be calculated from the arguments in this way. Okay, and using this, and using measures, we can express recursively defined um, properties about uh, algebraic data types. And the cool thing about this is that um, the type system actually works for us to um, instantiate and generalize those properties completely automatically. So whenever we are going to construct a list, the type system, just by using the type of the, for example, the cons constructor, will um, generalize the, the, this property that all the elements are natural numbers. And whenever we are matching a list, so whenever we are deconstructing a list, we will get those properties back completely automatically without needing any kind of uh, heuristics to instantiate quantifiers. And this is why refinement types have been um, so successful in doing in, um, in verification of non-trivial properties with very little to no manual input and doing these things um, completely automatically. So they've been used in verification. How can we use them in synthesis? Well, Let's try to use a refinement type to specify a synthesis goal. So remember that function replicate that I showed you in Google. How could we um, specify such a function? Well, I want to say, um, give me a function that takes a natural number and a value of any type beta and returns a list of values that are equal to its second argument and of the length that is equal to its first argument. OK, this is basically a complete specification of replicate. Um, and in order for the synthesis to work, we ha also have to provide some kind of components that can be used as uh, computation primitives. So in this case, we provided with, obviously, the list data type. Um, and also, we would give um, our synthesis procedure uh, increment and decrement functions over integers, for which we also have to provide um, the refinement types. But by the way, we don't even need their implementation. And the goal is now to find a function that has this type and uses those components, and can, can, is allowed to use those components. OK? So let me show you how this works with our prototype Im implementation real quick. Oh, no, first, first, that's something that I forgot to mention is um, so look at this uh, type. Of, of the list elements here. Surprisingly, if we replace it with just beta, this um, specification is as good as the previous one. And this could be surprising at first, but really, if you think about it, since this um, type parameter can be instantiated with any refined type, what this specification is really saying is that whatever property x happens to have, Every element of the list must have the same property, including the property of being equal to a particular value. So this actually shows us how um, expressive polymorphic refinement types really are, because they let us abstract or quantify over refinements. So let me show what our prototype implementation would do, given this as input. So I have prepared it here. Um, for replicate. So it takes us a split second to generate this implementation here, which basically says um, it, it will be a recursive function that um, the algorithm decided to name f2, uh, which it takes n and the y as arguments, and um, it synthesized this branching here. If, um, if the length parameter is less than or equal to 0, which basically means 0 because its type is natural, uh, then it will return a nil. And otherwise, it will cons a y to a recursive call of the same function f2 on uh, the same y, y argument, but uh, the, fir the first argument is decremented, which is what you would expect. Um, but note that the algorithm was able to infer this condition here, which is pretty nice, but I'll tell you later how it's done. Okay, let me show you another example that is a little bit more involved. So this is insertion into a sorted list. So we want to synthesize a function that takes an x of any type beta, and it takes an increasing list of, uh, list of betas, and it produces an increasing list 
whose uh, set of elements is the union of a set of elements of x's and the singleton set x. What is an increasing list? How can we define a sorted list using uh, refinement types? Well, it's actually very easy. We say that an increasing list of alphas is either an empty list, or to make an increasing list of alphas, we have to cons some alpha to an increasing list of elements that are greater or equal um, to the head, right? But that's very easy. So here we assume that the comparisons are actually uh, generic here. So they, they are defined on, on any alpha um, whatsoever. All right. And on top of that, we can just as we uh, added the length measure in the previous example, we can add this a different measure that returns the set of elements of the list, but exactly in the same way. And uh, with this definition at hand, we can uh, define this um, insert function. Okay, so for this example, um, it would take our tool slightly longer because it's a more complex example, but still, in just over one second, we can synthesize this implementation, which is again a recursive function with two arguments, and it would match on the list and say if, it's, if the list is empty, we'll just return a singleton list of x, and then otherwise, it will compare x to the head of the list, and then if x is less equal to the head of the list, it would just cons x to that whole list again. And otherwise, it will um, cons that, that, uh, that y to the recursive call of, of the same insert function, which is, again, the implementation that you would expect. It doesn't seem like much at first, but actually, to verify such an implementation, you need some non-trivial reason reasoning if you think about it. Because to verify this branch that um, actually this cons y to insert x, y produces a sorted list, what you need to know is that all the elements of the list that is returned by the, recur by the recursive call are greater or equal than y. And basically, uh, this means that you need to know that you, if you insert something that is greater or equal to y into a list of things that are greater or equal to y, you get a list where everything is greater or equal to y, which basically means that you have to strengthen the specification of the insert function itself to, uh, for it to provide you with this property, which requires some kind of specification discovery. And uh, in the language of refinement types, what it really means is that we have to figure out a refined instantiation for this beta type here to say that in this particular call to insert, its type won't be just an ink list of betas, but it will be an ink list of something, oh, this should be beta, sorry, not int, uh, of something that is greater or equal to y. So how do we do this? How do we automatically discover predicates like this? And in general, how do we do this um, type checking of refinement types completely automatically, which is what we need for synthesis? Yeah, by the way, since this um, uh, non-trivial reasoning is involved, this is actually a first example of automatically generated implementation of insertion to a link list that is, full, that is fully verified, unboundedly verified. Um, because Leon can generate this as well, but it cannot verify it because it cannot discover this kind of properties. All right, so, so how do we do this type checking? Well, uh, the thing is there is a technique that can inf infer this kind of refinements completely automatically and do refinement type checking completely automatically. And this is liquid type inference from, again, RNG Jala's group at uh, UCSD. And this technique relies on a combination of uh, conventional hindley milner style uh, type inference to infer the shapes of the refinement types, which means um, um, the conventional type that underlies the, the refinement type. And then it uses predicate abstraction to infer the refinements. Well, so can we just use this as the verification for a synthesis procedure and just be done with it? Well, that would be nice, but unfortunately, this um, method is fundamentally a whole program analysis. And how do I mean that? Well, let's see how uh, liquid type inference would do on this example, where we want to check this expression, if x is less than 0, then a singleton list with minus 1, otherwise a singleton list with 1, against this type 
list of naturals. Obviously, it does not have this type. There is a type error here. But how, will, how would uh, liquid type inference do here? Well, the thing is that liquid type inference is meant for really uh, type inference in the context where no user type annotations are provided. So it doesn't even assume that this top level, the, the type of the top level expression is known. It just tries to discover um, type of every expression from the types of its sub-expressions, completely from scratch. So let's say it doesn't know this type. So let's uh, look at the, all the sub-expressions of this expression. And um, so we, we know what types of 1 and minus 1 are. Um, and we know that those list expressions are all uh, of type list, but we don't know uh, the, the instantiation for the generic parameter. So what uh, liquid type inference would do, it will first invoke Hindley-Milner, which would infer the shape of all of its types. And it, so it will know that it's a list of integers, but we don't know what the refinements are yet. So then they would insert predicate unknowns in all the places in, the, in those inferred shapes where the refinement is missing. And then they will use uh, predicate abstraction to reconstruct those refinements uh, bottom up in a completely bottom up style. So for example, and they, would and they would construct the strongest refinement that is allowed by the sub-expressions. For example, here, uh, uh, since the nil is not restricted by anything, its strongest type is a uh, list of false. Um, then, basically, to discover the type of this cons, we would have to take some kind of list upper bound of, of those two, and we would get the list of um, minus ones. And here, in the same way, we'll get the list of ones. And then at the top level, we will take sort of a list upper bound of those. And let's say um, uh, in our language, we can only express it um, this type as um, list of true. And at this point, we see that list of true is not a subtype of list of nats. And we discover that there is a type error. But you can see that we had to analyze the whole program uh, before we could, see, uh, we could discover this type error. And there's really two problems here. First problem is that the type information is not propagated top down, because we don't even assume that there is any type information at the top. Um, but the second problem is that there are really those two stages. There is this Hindley-Milner uh, shape inference, which is known to be a global approach. So it generates all the unification constraints and then solves all of them for the whole program. And only after that first phase is done for the whole program, we can start inferring the refinements. And uh, this kind of whole program type inference might work completely fine in the setting of verification. But it's really a terrible idea for synthesis. And let me give you a little analogy to show you why. So let's say you have a combination lock. And you, uh, verification is like, when you're pretty sure that you know the combination and you just want to double check that you're not wrong. So in that situation, you are not, um, uh, so, so you're not really hindered by the fact that the lock will only tell you if the combination is correct once, once you get all the numbers right, which is like a global, uh, global uh, verification. But synthesis is like lock picking. So if you really don't know the combination and you want to determine the combination, then it would be really great if that lock could tell you for every digit if that digit is correct or not. You would be able to pick that lock much faster. Right? So we need this kind of magic lock technology for <laughs> modular verification technology to enable scalable synthesis. OK, how can we modify this global bottom-up uh, liquid type inference to make it modular and enable um, scalable synthesis? Well, first of all, we have to make use of the fact that we actually have this top-level type available and uh, try to propagate this type information top-down. So in this case, let's say we know this must be a list of nats. We have those sub-expressions. So we can easily propagate this information down to both branches of the if and uh, basically say, well, if the whole thing is a list of nuts, then the then branch it must be a list of nuts after the, under the assumption of, of the if condition. And the other one is also must be a list of nuts under the assumption of the negation of the if condition, something like this. Um, unfortunately, we cannot propagate uh, type information all the way top down to the least because 
um, it's not possible to propagate it through functional applications. A type of the functional application doesn't uniquely determine the type of the function and the type of the argument. So at this point, we sort of have to switch direction and go uh, bottom up for a while until those directions meet. And this is really the idea behind bidirectional type checking, which was discovered by um, Pearson Turner in, in the year 2000. And we will be using this idea here. So let's say we got down to here, and then we start top down, um, and then we start bottom up. But then at this point, those two directions meet, and this is where we can do our, our type check, and this will be much more local. So at this point, um, we do some shape inference, and then we discover that there is a type error without even looking, before even looking at the second branch of the if. So we really made this, this uh, type checking much more local and much more modular. Um, OK, so basically, this is our proposal for uh, synthesis from refinement types. It's just like before, except instead of um, this uh, co program liquid type inference, we use this new technique, which we call modular refinement type reconstruction. And it combines the ideas from bidirectional type checking, as I just told you. It still uses the same kind of um, techniques m motivated by predicate abstraction to discover uh, the, the predicates. And um, one technical challenge that it really has to address is, well, now we cannot do a phase of shape inference for the whole program before we start uh, discovering refinements. So we needed to find a way to interleave uh, shape, in uh, shape inference and refinement inference. And this, this turned out to be possible. Um, and uh, one other thing that we do differently from liquid type inference is since we're doing things uh, mostly top down, we're actually inferring the weakest uh, types, uh, instead the weakest refinements instead of the strongest refinements. And doing that allows us to use exactly the same mechanism that we use for inferring types to infer branch conditions in the conditionals, which is what you saw um, in the first uh, example. Because it, if you think about it, we have a mechanism for predicate discovery. Why not use it for, for branch conditions? OK, so at this point, uh, just putting it all together, the whole um, enumeration and verification parts of our uh, approach, I can just show you the first example again, the replicate example, but really step by step how the whole um, search works. So on this slide, what we have is, so the current goal type, this is what we want to synthesize, and the current available components, this is the environment that we can use, and the current program that we, um, th that is the output of the synthesis. So the first thing that our tool will do is look at this goal type and see, well, it's a function type. So we know that the output will be a function. So it's really easy to deal with that. So basically, what it would do is uh, we'll say, well, to synthesize a function is really just synthesizing its body given its arguments. So it will add the arguments of the function, like n and x, into, uh, into the environment, into the set of available components. And it will also give this function a name um, because it wants to make the, this function recursive in its first argument, but not the second because uh, this first argument is um, of, of type NAT, which has a predefined, um, well-founded order. So the tool is allowed to recurse on this argument, but not on the second one, which, which has a type which we don't know anything about. And to enable recursion, what the tool does is it basically adds as another component to the environment um, the same function, which would basically be used as a recursive call. But note that its type is slightly different. So instead of the first argument just being of type nat, it's actually of type um, of something between 0 and uh, strictly less than n. Which, so basically, our tool weakens the type of this function in such a way that it can only be called on arguments that are strictly smaller than, than the one that we are originally called with, which will um, guarantee that all the recursive calls terminate. And by the way, if uh, you're used, if you're in verification, you're probably used to that you can ignore termination arguments for a while and say you're only verifying partial correctness. But in synthesis, you really cannot ignore termination at all because 
non-terminating programs are always shorter than terminating ones, so you will always get garbage if you don't take care um, uh, that the programs are terminating. Okay, at this point, our target type is this. We just need a list of betas that are um, of length n. So the tool will first try a bunch of uh, simpler expressions that are just function applications, but it will not uh, succeed. So at some point, it will uh, decide to introduce a conditional. But the condition is still unknown, and it's uh, represented by this predicate unknown u1. And then at this point, the tool will focus on uh, synthesizing uh, the first branch. So for the first branch, it will start enumerating function applications from simplest to more complex. And the simplest um, expression that can go into this first branch and has the, the right uh, type shape, so it's a list of betas, would be a nil, an empty list. So it tries this value nil for the first branch, and then it would try to use predicate obstruction to infer the weakest condition under which this would be um, an appropriate implementation um, of the function. So at this point, so, so as you can see, u1 is, um, uses an assumption here as a sort of a path condition. At this point, it will infer that under this condition that n is uh, less than or equal to 0, this is actually um, the type of nil is actually a subtype of what we want. Say n equals zero there. Oh, that's uh, so. This is a very good question. I kind of avoided the question of how we actually infer those predicates. But um, so what liquid types do, uh, and what we do as well, is we are given a set of uh, atomic predicates, or rather, atomic predicate templates. Um, and all the predicates that we infer are just conjunctions of those atomic predicates. So here, I assume that the atomic predicates that we're given are a variable less than or equal zero, variable greater or equal zero, or variable non equal zero. From those, we can make various kind of inequalities and, and equalities, but we always infer the weakest one that fits. So here, since um, this one is weaker than equality, this is what we'll get. But if you add equality as as an atomic predicate, then you might as well get equality. That's just a matter of luck then, because those two are incomparable. They will be incomparable. Uh, syntactically, but semantically. Actually, no, we do, we do uh, semantic checks on them as well to cut the search space. So you will, so you will actually get this one anyway. Uh, all right, so now we are done with the first branch. And then, uh, of course, now the task is to synthesize the second branch under uh, the assumption of the negated um, of the negated if condition. So now we add this not and uh, less than or equal to 0 to the assumptions. And now we have to synthesize, again, an expression that has this type. So again, the tool will try a bunch of, uh, uh, will start trying function applications starting from the simplest ones. So nil cannot be made to satisfy this, uh, this restriction on the length in this, in this case, because we know that n is greater or equal to 0 and the length of nil is 0, and we know that from this refinement. So nil doesn't fit, so we try something a bit more complex. Maybe there will be a cons, and for a cons, we have to synthesize the arguments now. And again, for each argument, we will start trying simpler um, expressions first. So at, at some point, we will arrive to this. Uh, cons of x, and then we, um, as the second argument to cons, we decide to use this recursive call. And at this point, we have to synthesize now the arguments for this call. So what I wanted to draw your attention to is that when we are synthesizing the first argument of f, we are actually really lucky here because uh, the precondition on this first argument is really strong. So uh, this precondition will be used to filter the candidates for this first argument very locally. So for example, if, we're, if we will be trying n here, uh, then even before synthesizing the second argument and going all the way up to the type of the whole else branch, we will know that n is not a suitable candidate here because we know that a suitable argument has to be less than n. So n is not suitable, inc n is definitely not suitable, and at this point we know that we have to choose dec n um, locally. Okay, at some point, uh, this will give us the desired uh, result, and we don't have any um, holes in our program anymore, and this is done. 
So as you can see, the enumeration part of our census procedure is at this point really basic. So it, it really does explicit enumeration from um, simpler expressions to more complex. But so what we really put some thought into is that verification part. So we try to make it, make it as modular and as automatic as possible. And already this combination enables, um, um, it lets us uh, synthesize some interesting programs. But we're hoping that if um, we also make the enumeration part smarter at some point, then we will get even better results. So this prototype, yeah. Back, uh, yeah. So uh, in the specification of f, um, try to understand what is n there. So it says it takes an argument m. Yeah, it, so we renamed the arguments uh, here. Be, so uh, because n and x are already taken, we just picked fresh names for the arguments because we don't want to repeat them. So n is a given constant. So no basically, n was initially uh, the argument that was given uh, here. Mm -hmm. So, and this, this n would be added to uh, the environment. Uh, we just take the n from, from that type and add it to the environment. And that n is also used uh, in the type of... So the so system automatically inferred that b should be less than n or that well, This is just because this n is the name of the first argument of the function in, in the outermost call. So we are, we are inferring the body um, of f called with n, and we know that if we want to make a recursive call from there, then the first argument has to be less than this n. Yeah, I agree. It's not very clear here so, because so, so the this is assumption that every time function will make a recursive call on, on only the first argument, and it will decrease somehow. Well, the there's uh, so basically this um, uh, method is also parametric with respect to what particular order you choose um, uh, to make your recursive call term recursive calls terminate. So what our tool uses at the moment is it chooses the first argument that it can recurse on and just uses that one. But it will be uh, also possible to, it actually has a switch to make, for example, the lexicographic tuple of all recursible arguments um, as, as they are. Integers or, or, for example, if I want to synthesize a program that copies two lists, so it right. takes two lists as arguments, mm -hmm. so what kind of thing would come up there? Uh, so for um, data types, what we do at the moment is basically you're allowed to specify um, the measure that uh, the measure that will be used uh, to compare those lists. So for example, if you define a length of lists, and length maps list to integers, and integers already have an order in our the predefined order in our system. You can just say compare list by length, or in other instances you can say compare them by elements. This is one of the choices. We could also make, of course, structural um, recursion that would also be possible. But we thought this would be more flexible if we do it this way. More questions? Okay. So yeah, that tool that I showed you is called Syncwit uh, from Synthesis and Liquid. Um, and it's available on Bitbucket. It, as I said, it's still work in progress, hasn't been really released yet, but hopefully it will be soon. And um, you're welcome to try it. Uh, and as the, my last slide, I present my kind of vision for where this project might be going. So I showed you Hoogle in the beginning. But wouldn't it be cool if we had something like Hoogle, but that uses refinement types to, and can do both more precise search in the documentation, but also if the function that you're looking for does not exist, it could synthesize the function from using all of those um, functions from the base library as components. So I call this um, Hoogle Plus. So for example, you give Hoogle Plus something like, well, I want a function that takes some value x, x and the list of x's, and um, produces an integer value that is equal to the number of occurrences of x and x's. So here I um, basically just um, using another measure on lists, which returns a bag of, like a multiset of elements that I call bag. And then I say, well, it's, a, uh, it's the multiplicity of x in that multiset that I want. 
because there is no uh, primitive function in, in Haskell that returns the number of occurrences of an element in the list. Uh, this um, query would require to do some little synthesis, and then maybe what it return would be something like this. Um, yeah, with that. Lucky. <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe, maybe then you can also have friends on Google Plus <laughs> or circles. Um, yeah, questions? So I'm trying to uh, uh, think how would a technique work if the specification was in the form of examples. So earlier you mentioned that one problem with examples is that you might require too many of those. But uh, uh, one way to avoid this uh, aspect is to uh, say that you're looking for a small program or the smallest program that you can find which matches the examples mm -hmm. and then I think you know less number of examples would do the trick so for instance in your case of um, copying the number of in a specific element a certain number of times if I just even give you one example with a large value of n like five or six uh, my feeling is that the program that you synthesize mm -hmm. is in fact the shortest program that will be consistent with that example right so but for example the uh, one of the tools that I mentioned myth is using exactly this heuristic that they're looking for the shortest progr program. But um, as I said, they still need 13 examples to um, specify drop. And they, uh, their paper even says that it was not trivial sometimes to come up with those examples. And it's really an interactive process where you think you have specified everything, but then the tool always comes up with some corner cases. And, and one of the reasons why they need so many examples is uh, they have this property of trace completeness. So when they are synthesizing a recursive function, you, because you don't know, uh, you don't have any specification for the function. So whenever you would have the synthesized implementation is using the recursive call, you need another example that would specify this recursive call. So basically, if you're um, specifying length of lists, you specify something on, on list of length four, you have to specify also for length three, two, and one, and zero. And this is how I think those sets of examples get get larger. I think in that case, probably it's limited by the technique they are using. Because I mm -hmm. can assume that if I want to specify a drop of a function, I'll give a long list, and I'll specify I want to drop this element, and in the output that won't be present. And simplest function would be to drop, or yeah, because mm -hmm. um, I remember for sketch we were doing by examples, doing list delete. We only needed two examples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's the limitation of their technique. But um, so I think what would be really cool is to combine those, right? Because, and I think it's even not that difficult because examples are refinement types in some way, right? Um, so bringing examples into this framework would be great because, uh, of course, the um, disadvantage of refinement types is that you cannot express anything. Uh, you can't express everything you want because it's uh, still decidable logic. And the combination of, of those things and examples, that, that would be a really great idea. Because even your technique will probably have this issue if um, the overall specification for the function is not strong enough or inductive enough to prove its correctness and you need to actually define it or you need to be able to strengthen it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this can happen that of course the, your specification is not strong enough, but we think um, that it's even uh, an advantage at some and in some cases to be able to provide a partial specification because one other problem with examples is that what if it's basically you have to know what the output is uh, of the program and not, might not be trivial all, all the time. For example, you want to specify an insertion to a red black tree. You basically have to know how red black trees work to be able to specify the output. Whereas with specifications, it's much easier to say, here's an invariant of red black tree, and here's what I want in terms of the set of elements, and then you go figure it out. Um, so this this really, yeah, a trade-off here. So there are tools like um, like ACL2 and, um, and Isabel that, that construct proofs of, of inductive uh, sorts of things. Um, the, the, when you mentioned that, that your um, insertion into a sorted list was the first um, that actually I mean, verifies it as well. What, what, I mean, what would something like ACL2 do when it, when it can, I mean, can it construct terms that the, are executable programs? This is a very good question. It's probably 
I mean, I don't know really an answer to this question. It's, it's probably possible to use, yeah, of course, there's a lot of research in the area of proof synthesis uh, that is kind of, sep that was kind of separate from program synthesis, even though we know theoretically that it's the same thing. So I think there's much more potential in bringing that work, that like old school work in proof synthesis more into program synthesis and seeing what those things can do. Yeah, I was really, when I said this is the first verified implementation, synthesized implementation, I, re I was really comparing with those uh, really program synthesis tools uh, that, yeah, that I was considering. But it would be a good comparison to see, to look at those other tools. So to, to can you briefly, briefly explain the, like the expressive power and uh, how you need like, for a user to write like a refined types? Is that like, so, so? Yeah, I mean, as I said, theoretically, of course, there are limitations, but um, so I I think so. What I learned from uh, let's say Ranjit Jal and his uh, his group is that. People are finding more and more creative ways of arranging those types inside, uh, to express properties that you wouldn't think before would be expressible. And of course, things. Um, so, the type system that we use uh, here uh, only so only has have those features that I showed, but. Their research on on, ver on type checking actually went further than that, and they have more features that we hope we can add later. So they have things like abstract refinements, for example, where you can parameterize your type not just by a uh, type, uh, as in polymorphic types, but also by a predicate. So you can easily specify things like, let's say, filter using those abstract predicates. Yeah, and um, so I think those. Uh, this kind of refinement types are, are really just this um, surprising combination of uh, they're surprisingly expressible and still decidable. And I think, and I thought it was really worth exploring for synthesis. But of course, there's theoretical the limitations to this as well. One great thing about refinement types is that you're able to locally prune the search space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is there some comparison if these were not there? What what would the time be? So let's say you're just trying out end-to-end -end type. You don't have these local types for each variable. Right, so... How much is the gain? Is it I mean, I cannot say how... Um, I can really compare with a different kind of specification, but what we did in the paper in our pre preliminary experiments is basically we did the synthesis in this way with local checking, and then we disabled local checking and just doing all the checking on the top level. And uh, so we saw that, well, what, what you would expect for very small examples, there's no difference. But uh, with the bigger examples, there was a big difference. So maybe I can even bring it up. Um, Oh yeah, right here. So for example, examples like append, deletion from a list, and both of the functions on sorted list that we tried to synthesize timed out. I think timeout was like two or three minutes, so it could not synthesize it with a whole program analysis. But with a modeler analysis, it would take like some, some kind of seconds. And yeah, so it's, it's what you would expect. This kind of um, whole program analysis doesn't really scale as we um, as we go to more complex programs. Um, so, um, thank you all for coming in for your questions. So, Nadia is going to be here all week. If, um, uh, if you'd like to chat with her um, one-on-one, please let me know. So, uh, thank you, Nadia. Yeah.